All right, our speaker is all ready for you, and she is going to speak about the Underground Railroad. I'm going to read a little bit about her background. In 2020, Linda retired as managing director of the Dow Jones News Foundation. She was with the News Fund for 32 years. Founded in 1958 by editors of the Wall Street Journal and supported by Dow Jones. It promotes careers in journalism by providing paid professional summer internships for college students with newspapers, news services, websites, and broadcast outlets. Everybody hear me? Mm -hmm. Yes, good. It also funds high school workshops and publishes career literature. Diversity and, and inclusion are central to its work. Ms. Shockley was the first African American and the first woman to, excuse me, to lead the fund. She previously worked for 12 years as an education reporter, news editor, bureau chief, columnist, and city editor at what was then Gannett Suburban Newspapers in Westchester County, New York. Today, she acts as a consultant focusing on historic preservation, African American history, and diversity in media and journalism education. She is also president of the Lawnside Historical Society, which owns and manages the Peter Mott House in Lawnside. She has been with the society for 27 years. And I would like to present her right now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so very much. I'm going to try to share my screen. Okay, here we go. Well, thank you so much for this introduction and the invitation to come speak. Um, I have been involved with the Lawnside Historical Society since it was organized in 1990, but I grew up in Lawnside and so we knew the history of our community. Um, many of our teachers were people who were descended from settlers who had come through the Underground Railroad to the community. And we were told the history of the town. As I have said often to folks in other settings, uh, one of the things that we learned about our community was uh, thanks to our school doctor. We had a doctor who was located in the school and he was a resident of the area. He was born in the 1800s. <laughs> He uh, attended kindergarten in 1895 and graduated from Howard University Medical School in 1911. Um, so he was a practicing physician, and in those days they came to your home, they were embedded in the school, and he was a person who had collected history. Now his family can actually trace their origins um, between Ireland and Americans and African Americans in Burlington County to 250 years ago. Um, he was a collector and avid collector, so he kept all kinds of documents and information. And so some of the things that you're going to see in our slide presentation actually came from Dr. Roscoe Moore's collection, which his son, uh, his son Spencer, uh, bequeathed to the Historical Society on his passing. So that's just a little preamble. But I call I call this presentation once I built on a foundation of families because that's the unit that we deal with as a community. We deal with families, and we talked about love a little earlier, and that is an important part of love and family. Hello. 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 
So this is just a little snapshot of one side. It was incorporated as the municipality by an act of the legislature in 1926. And it's bounded by Haddonfield, Tavistock, Barrington, Magnolia, uh, Somerdale, and Cherry Hill. So we're surrounded by several other communities. This is a picture of the first mayor and council there on the grounds of a hotel that used to stand on the White Horse Pike. Interestingly enough, some of them are descendants of people who escaped slavery. And, and it's quite uh, exceptional that um, just one generation out of slavery, uh, one of these people was elected to the borough council. Longside is the first African-American incorporated municipality in the state of New Jersey. And uh, interestingly enough, above the Mason-Dixon line. After the Civil War, uh, two communities are vying for the title of first incorporated municipality. <laughs> One is Princeville, North Carolina, and the other is Mount Bayou, Mississippi. So we are the first uh, above the Mason-Dixon line. Hmm. So we want to talk about slavery in southern New Jersey. Slavery was an institution throughout the United States. One of the things that happens when people come to the Peter Monhouse Underground Railroad Museum is we talk about where the people escape from. And most of the time, people are suggesting that folks came from South Carolina and Georgia, um, Alabama, and such places as that, not realizing that slavery was an institution in all 13 colonies including New Jersey. So we like to make that point. Now, this is a picture of the three markers that the Camden County Historical Society began placing in 2017. And if you notice, the locations are all in the city of Camden, Cooper Point, Cooper Street, and Federal Street. These are where slave auctions were held in the city of Camden. You have the Delaware River, why go all the way to Philadelphia? If you're interested in purchasing uh, human beings, you could do that right in the city of Camp. So uh, the society intends to continue placing these markers and they have several more locations. Um, hopefully that they'll be able uh, to place this. So this is just a picture of the Peter Mine House. We, we're closed because of the pandemic. Um, we celebrated our 31st anniversary for the Historical Society last Saturday on the lawn of the Mine House. And we had a, a joyous time. We also have a, a Facebook page. We have a Twitter account. We started an Instagram account. So you can follow us. I <laughs> once I missed you know, <laughs> that she doesn't do some of that social media. <laughs> but if she did, if anybody else wants to, they could follow us on Instagram. So one of the first books that we learned about the history of Longside from was Charles Smiley's A True Story of Longside, New Jersey. I first read this book in the Haddonfield uh, Public Library. It was, and it's a little 32 page pamphlet. Now, Mr. Smiley was a cousin of Dr. Roscoe Moore. And so he actually began working on this book in about 1915. He is a descendant of a family that was many knitted, that was uh, freed from slavery in 1843 in Maryland. The family made its way to Longside and Mr. Smiley began to compile a family history, but he also compiled a history of the municipality of the town. And he sent out cards to people if they had recollections, if they had documents, uh, anything that they'd like to share, he was working on this book. And it was very interesting to see that because, you know, he sent this mail and there were actually uh, some envelopes, Dr. Moore saved just about everything. He saved the envelopes and it just said Lawnside, New Jersey, Charles Smiley. It <laughs> didn't have any street address or anything like that, but somehow he collected this material. And one of the things that he wrote about the town 
was that it was a place of freedom to an oppressed people, so much so that they with thankful hearts called it haven, and the secrecy was to conceal their habitation from the oppressors. So the booklet is full of that kind of language and that level of writing ability. And it really just capsulized how did we come to be in that little area. Now, there are lots of um, theories about how we came to be there. Um, if we know that uh, we're located near Hanfield, um, the Society of Friends opposed slavery from the outset initially, and that the story goes that Ralph Smith, we were taught was a Quaker from Haddonfield, platted out land in the 1840s and provided opportunities for people to come and live there inexpensively. Now, uh, we later learned during the research that Ralph Smith was actually from more than liberties, a section of Philadelphia, and he was a member of the Philadelphia Vigilance Committee. He was also a contemporary of William Still, who many people know as the father of the Underground Railroad. He was the secretary. If you saw that movie, Harriet, you saw him depicted by uh, Leslie Odom Jr. Um, but William Still was driven as a secretary to record the stories of people in the Underground Railroad and to help. Uh, someone was asked, why would, um, what does suffrage or voting have to do with the Underground Railroad? And the thought that people wanted to be free meant that they also wanted to be full citizens. So of course they wanted the right to vote. Um, so it was, it was a curious question uh, to me. And uh, it's one that we're still grappling with as to who can vote and when they can vote and where they can vote uh, in the 21st century. But I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself. <laughs> So as I mentioned, we had this theory that Lawnside originated in the 1840s, uh, thanks to uh, Quaker activism and abolitionist movement. But we have to consider that our African Methodist Episcopal Church, Mount Kisgah, was organized in 1792. Mm -hmm. And so it was populated by people even in 1792. Uh, which indicates that people were already there. Interestingly enough, the state of New Jersey actually in 1804 begins something that they call gradual abolition. We're going to free people, but, but not right now, <laughs> not at this moment. So they passed this law in February of 1804 that any child born after July 4th, 1804, was considered free. Wow. However, they were the ward of their mother's owner <laughs> until they reached the age of 21 if they were female and 25 if they were a male. So as the ward of their mother's owner, then they could be hired out to work for someone else or they work for that owner until they reached that age of maturity. Now, theoretically, they were supposed to be given a suit of clothes, they should be able to read and write and to do sums and figures. Um, but as you can see, this process was not immediate. And so one of the things that the legislature did was to try to appease people who had purchased other human beings uh, by not having them meet this uh, financial burden. Uh, one of the things that uh, some people threatened to do was to free all of the old and infirm so that they would become wards of the state essentially. So they came up with this uh, compromise. Now, it would be interesting for a child to become a free person while their parent was still enslaved. So theoretically, uh, in 1826, a young woman could be a free person 
uh, yet her mother was still enslaved. And usually the condition of the child proceeded from the condition of the mother. And we know, unfortunately, in some cases that the fathers of these children were also the owners mm -hmm. of the mother. Uh, but that wasn't written into the law. <laughs> So Henry Peter Mott, who, who was he and where did he come from? We call this house the Peter Mott house. We think he was born between 1807 and 1810, and he lived as a free black farmer. He married Elizabeth Ann Thomas in 1832 in Gloucester County. And we know that there was only, either when you were in Gloucester County or you were in Burlington County, there was no such thing as Camden County until 1844. He built this two-story farmhouse around 1845, we think he may have purchased the property from his father-in-law, but his father-in-law may have gotten his property from a man named Jacob C. White, who interestingly enough was a dentist of Harvard, a Philadelphian and a member of the Philadelphia Vigilance Committee hmm. and a partner in the enterprise of establishing Snow Hill Free Haven with Ralph Smith. That so-called Haddonfield Quaker who's really from Northern Liberties in Philadelphia. <laughs> when I went to school for journalism, one of the things that they used to say, if your mother tells you she loves you, check it out. <laughs> so, you, you, you have to do uh, research and sometimes we have, we have seen things that were written that were mistaken. Now, this is Peter's death certificate. Uh, he died in 1881. He is buried at Mount Pisgah Church, according to this. He was buried uh, by the undertaking company established by Edward Miller. Today we know that funeral home is the Carl Miller Funeral Home. It's based in Camden. We also had a branch in Lawnside. So this is the seventh generation of the Miller Funeral Home. And I did say Peter was a Sunday school superintendent at Mount Pisgah. So here's some contradictory uh, census records. And I don't know if you can see this, but we're making reference to Peter Mott and Elizabeth and entries from 1850 versus 1870. 1850 and before, Peter and Elizabeth and say that they were born in New Jersey. And why wouldn't they, right? We abolished slavery theoretically, so um, they shouldn't, excuse me, we didn't abolish slavery. We ended the slave trade and we're abolishing slavery gradually. So, you know, theoretically, they will not, they were not enslaved people. They were not indentured servants. They were not apprentices. They were free people. When we look at this 1870 census after the Civil War, Peter says he was born in Delaware. And Elizabeth Ann says she was born in Virginia. Hmm. <laughs> okay, so we're talking, well, Delaware's not so bad. Delaware was a slaveholding state. They didn't have any gradual abolition or anything of that nature. Uh, Delaware did not uh, secede from the Union with the Confederacy, but it did not support the Union hmm. during the Civil War. So Peter and Elizabeth Ann might have thought it was in their best interest to say, hey, we were born in New Jersey until after the Civil War, and then they admitted to being born in what might be considered slaveholding states. 1870s seemed kind of safe. The Civil War was over in 1865, so yeah, things, things are probably okay, but um, not really. <laughs> So here's some other settlers who landed in the one side. Um, once again, there's a Peter Smiley. He owned the store. He's part of, of Charles Smiley's family. And then the Arthur family is another group of people. Uh, my eighth grade English teacher was a member of this family. Hannah Davy, uh, James, and Isaac, uh, believed to have escaped from Snow Hill, Maryland to uh, Lawn side, which was also called Snow Hill at some point. Why would you name a place after somewhere you had escaped from? Let us not return to Egypt. Uh, yet we have New Egypt. Uh, we are in New Jersey. We have Lord Jersey, uh, New England, uh, 
people escaped from England. Um, so uh, there were some fondness that people had for where they came from. And as a matter of course, a lot of people ended up moving from um, Snow Hill, Maryland, and that Eastern Shore area and coming to this area. It's another curious thing about migrations that people tend to gravitate toward uh, the places where they know someone from their home place. And uh, we, we believe that that is a large part of some of our growth of our community. There's also the Cooper family who was headed by Charles, whose freedom was purchased for him by the Coopers of Haddonfield. Now, Charles is the father of the councilman that I referred to from 1926. Um, so that's always amazing to me. And, and the Cooper family has an annual day where they recount the story of Charles, Charlie, and uh, his wife, Sidonia. And it's interesting also when we look at the proximity of some of these communities um, that people uh, married. So Charles was in Haddonfield, but he met a young woman named Sidonia Fussell from a place called Fussell Town, which is now uh, where you see the Pizza Hut or the Taco Bell in Collinswood area. That was considered Fussell Town. So there were these little communities that developed. Sadler Town is another one of these communities in Haddon Township. Um, you, near the Rhodes Temple United Methodist Church, uh, there was a whole area, had been 50 acres, and that moved from Joshua Sadler, who was escaped from, once again, Maryland, and he went to the Evans Farm in what we now call Cherry Hill, and it's Croft Farm recreational area. Um, and, the, and the meeting there had in township set aside 50 acres for Joshua. And that community began to grow. Um, here's another example of slavery in Southern New Jersey. Um, this shows the Hinchman Lippincott Plantation in Haddon Heights. Now, John Hinchman was a landowner from New York. He moved to this area. He brought enslaved people with him, and he also purchased uh, and a child. He purchased a child from John Hug. Now, I don't know how many of you uh, remember that the Department of Transportation uh, wanted to destroy a 1700 era house along Interstate 295 and where it meets 42 and 676. That was the hub house. That was a hub plantation. So a uh, henchman purchased this uh, young man from uh, from Mr. Hub. Um, this is now the uh, park, the county park in Haddon Heights, and the uh, Haddon Heights Historical Society created a marker uh, that explained some of this history, um, which was not. Uh, so pleasing to some of the people who live nearby. They that <laughs> unfortunate story. We don't need to uh, rehash that. But in, in truth and in fact, um, this was a plantation and people weren't enslaved there. <laughs> so Dr. Cheryl LaRoche from the University of Maryland has written a book called The Geography of Resistance, Three Black Communities and the Underground Railroad. And she makes this interesting point about African American, African Methodist Episcopal churches and uh, societies of friends, Quaker communities, Presbyterian communities, and that where there was some proximity, that likelihood of abolitionist activism was high. The people worked together. Our story about Peter Mott was that he took people in his wagon to the friends in Haddonfield and Morristown. Once again, we're going from Gloucester County to Burlington County. And so that was that connection. If you look at the map, you'll see the little stars indicate the route along the Underground Railroad and the, and the existence 
of free black community. So this is where people set up. And I didn't even move all the way up into Timbuktu in Burlington County and beyond. But if we look at Woolwich and Greenwich and parts of Salem and Woodbury, we see that this, there's this proximity and there's this activism. So here, here's a map uh, done by the Camden, uh, I'm sorry, by the Rutgers University cartographers. And it shows that there are no other Northern state exceeded New Jersey in the number of all black communities that served as underground railroad sanctuary. Not only for Southern fugitives, um, we're talking about Salem County, Cumberland County, uh, Camden County and Burlington, these were rural places which people gravitated to. They could farm this land. They could sustain themselves there. And there were several instances recorded, however, of uh, slave catchers being run out of town. So um, this comes from Steal Away, Steal Away. It's a guide to the Underground Railroad. It's a booklet that was written by Giles Wright, who works for the New Jersey Historical Commission for many years. Uh, unfortunately, because of the pandemic, they have hundreds of these booklets, but you can't get a hold of them at the moment. So the library has digitized them. And so there's the link uh, to the digital version and you can download a PDF uh, to your heart's content. But here's a, here's a story of a kidnapper. And th this man apparently came to Snow Hill, George Alberti, um, to capture fugitives. He was a bounty hunter. You see that movie, Death the Dog, the bounty hunter. This is like, not so glorious. Here was a man who came to Snow Hill, and um, apparently local residents decided that they weren't going to let him get away with trying to capture somebody. And so they fired buckshot at him and they hit him, um, but it didn't kill him. And so uh, he went on to continue uh, doing his work. Now I found by reading the Philadelphia Telegraph of 1879 that he did in fact die a natural death, but he was convicted and imprisoned for several years for capturing a woman whose child was born free in New Jersey and handing her and the child over to her former owner. That was considered kidnapping because the child was free born, unable to advocate for himself. And so here was a child who was taken into slavery after his mother had struggled so hard to free him. I, I don't know what happened to the child. Have to do more research and more checking. The noble agent that I'm referring to once again is Jacob C. White Sr. He was that barber, a church elder, a dentist. Uh, he was a bleeder, apparently. So he, but then he attached leeches to people and bled them. Yes. The un yeah, ew, <laughs> unlicensed physician, but they thought that was effective medical treatment. And he was the secretary of the Philadelphia Vigilance Committee. He re is reported to have taken an entire family to Canada himself. So suspended his business to escort them into Canada because you know that England outlawed slavery. And so then Canada became a safe place to go. And with the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850, no place in the continental United States was considered safe, mm -hmm. uh, even to the point of deputizing federal marshals to accost and arrest people. Um, and then those federal marshals could in turn deputize a civilian and say that you had to help them capture a person suspected of being a slave because African-Americans had no right to represent themselves or to testify or speak in court, <laughs> you could go to court and say, I've never been enslaved. 
I'm a free person, always have been, and your testimony had no value. So people said you were an enslaved person, you were an enslaved person. And if you, as the deputized civilian, participated, you got $10 if the person was actually an enslaved person, and you got $5 if they weren't. Yeah. So you had no disincentive to participate except your conscience. Um, we recently went to the uh, Harriet Tubman Museum in Cape May. Anybody been able to go there? They're actually accepting visitors, so you have to uh, register online and, and then go and wear masks, etc. But they had a picture and a description of Jacob C. White Jr., who also became an agent of the Underground Railroad. So that's heartening to me, another generation. So here's Mount Peace Cemetery. Uh, this is a cemetery that was organized in 1902. We have found there are at least 108 Civil War military personnel buried there. Um, and it is because we believe that these people were turned away from uh, Arlington National Cemetery, Valley Forge, and other similar military cemeteries because of segregation. I'm not sure that the Department of uh, Defense pointed people in this way, but we have so many different units. The Massachusetts 54th, uh, 55th, uh, the 45th, the 3rd, the 6th, the 9th, uh, of course, which were uh, United States Colored Troops who were trained in Philadelphia. But uh, it just seems like a preponderance of people that seem to, in some cases, come as, from as far away as Maryland uh, that are buried in one side. So it's very curious to us as to what it is. And then uh, another researcher, Chanel Jordan, has found that some of these people were uh, enlisted in the military under assumed names so that they may have run away, escaped from enslavement to join the military. And that presents a, a whole different set of, of researcher problems, but it certainly speaks to their character and their commitment. So this is just a partial list of Lawnside Civil War veterans. 46 people from Lawnside uh, went to serve in the Civil War. Now, Medal of Honor recipient John Henry Lawson is really a Philadelphian, um, but he, he left his wife and children in Philadelphia to join the US Navy, and he was aboard the USS Hartford during its battle in Mobile Bay, where, you know, Admiral said, you know, damn the torpedoes full speed ahead. He was aboard that ship. He was wounded. And despite his wounds, he came topside and continued to fire mm -hmm. on uh, the Confederate Navy. And so for that, he was awarded uh, the Medal of Honor. He died in 1919. And in 2004, we had a ceremony to place a headstone for him symbolically at Mount Peace Cemetery. And his granddaughter came, who at that time was 99 years old. Oh, and she talked about having been at the graveside when he was buried hmm. and having known the story of his uh, life and his work. So this is another, um, this is another marker. This is actually at Mount Pisgah Church. And this is a man uh, that we just happened to notice. This is the biggest headstone at Mount Pisgah Church. And it belonged to Elisha Gaither, who was apparently aboard the USS Constitution during the War of 1812, um, off the shore of, of Nova Scotia, um, in the battle with the HMS Guerriere. And we're still trying to find out more information about him. We wrote to the USS Constitution Museum in the 1990s. Uh, we didn't get an answer. We got some material from the, uh, the Department of Defense. And uh, in 2010, we got a letter from the USS Constitution Museum asking us 
If we had any information, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Mr. Gaten. Oh my God. Uh, it's circular. And hopefully, there's something somewhere for the Department of, of the Navy in having information on the So, if you'd like to read more about the Underground Railroad in New Jersey, here are several books. Mm -hmm. um, Neighborhoods of Color by Dr. Gary Hunter at Rowan University. It talks about Southern New Jersey from 1638 to 2000. So there's just so many settlements and towns. And when you look at how they got their names, you find out that they have some connection to African-Americans who settled there and ran these communities. The Underground Railroad by Wayne Still, it was published in 1872, and their, uh, that book is still available uh, to the Library of Congress. And I think that Plexus Publishing here in Medford actually published the book. Yeah, the uh, William Still Historical Society, which is in Medford, does have copies that are available. James Still. James Still. You heard that, so you can get them from the William Still. Oh, there? James Still Historical Society. James Still. Yes, I'm sorry. James, Dr. James Still. Yeah. Then there's also Runaway Slaves, Rebels on the Plantation by John Luke Franklin. Interestingly enough, when I was in high school, we advocated to have African American history taught in high school. And we got a course. It was not required. It was an elective. So all the Lonsai kids were in the class, but the other kids were not. And it was never, uh, say, integrated or infused into the history, U.S. history or um, world civilization or any of that. And John Will Franklin, uh, the book that we used was From Slavery to Freedom, not to be misled by the name, the book starts in Africa. And so we learned about Songhai, Ghana, and Mali, and African civilizations, and then explanations of the transition as people became uh, captives and then enslaved, and the adjustments that were made even to language formation and the kinds of, of, uh, of food that people eat and that we eat now. And then the other books also uh, reference the Civil War. Um, on the Altar of Freedom is one of my favorites because it was uh, a book by compiled of letters from uh, James Henry Gooding, um, who was a soldier and a very eloquent one at that. And so, so ends my presentation. Uh, if you'd like to give to our firm foundation campaign, we are trying to raise $101,000 for work on the Mod House. As you know, an older building <laughs> speaks <laughs> and creaks and moves and, and sometimes leaks as well. So we're uh, uh, engaged in that. And uh, so I really do thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming. Gary gave us a whole new insight. Thanks for You're welcome. Thank you for having me. Yes? Was Peter Mott House uh, used as an underground railroad site, or was it just a go through? Um, it's not really clear to us exactly how extensive the use of the house was. Um, certainly people want to know, were they in the basement, were they in the attic? <laughs> you know, yes, it was a farm. And so while we see a, a, a small 56 by 104 uh, foot lot in a cul-de-sac with 20 attached houses surrounding it, his address was Whitehorse Pike. So it was a, a large farm. So there could have been outbuildings where people were. Uh, some people have stories within their families that their great grandmothers or their great great grandmothers cooked extra food and took it so that Elizabeth Ann would have uh, enough to feed the people that were coming through. But one of the things that's interesting, because we mentioned the AME churches. 
If you look at uh, Woolwich, uh, Mount Zion AME, and Woolwich and Mount Pisgah and Lawnside and Jacob's Chapel in Mount Laurel, uh, Macedonia AME Church in Camden, they have a similar a pastor, a singular pastor in common, Thomas Clement Oliver. He was pastor of all of those churches and he was known to be an agent of the underground world. So it's quite possible that the house could have done more and been more. Now, some members of the Haddonfield meeting have been researching this and I applaud them for trying to figure out just how closely Peter Mott was engaged with the Haddonfield meeting and what their relationship was um, with some detail. So we'd love to find out more. And I applaud Linda and David Marshall and others who are looking into that. And hopefully we can be helpful in finding more information. Um, Hi. Hi. Hello. Hi. My name is Avis Wanda McClinton. I used to party at Lawndale back at Lawrence High back in the day. Getting here from Pennsylvania wasn't an easy task going through the white communities. Um, and that was a place where we can let down our hair and shake our tail feathers. <laughs> but at the same time, I want to go back to slavery. You know that the uh, Haddonfield Quakers, they were slave owners. Um, ask them, what do they have in their records? Do they have any... Um, I'm a Quaker preservationist, and I live in Pennsylvania in a red line, all black community like Lawn Lawndale was, is. Um, and early Quakers wasn't all that hippity hop about uh, abolitionist stuff. I just pleaded a, a research with mm, Haverford College on the manumation of enslaved people by the Philadelphia yearly meeting and they didn't list not one Haverford um, manumission person from that meeting house. Mm -hmm. um, would you talking about the gradual and gradual release of slave Pennsylvania had that too, but what they would do was move them around and stuff. They really didn't really got their freedom because of that. And when you said they, they took it from the ladies, um, that was right because a lot of the enslaved people were the biological kids of like hadn't had meeting members. That's right there with you. Um, I'm, I'm doing a lot of research and it's real hard to call yourself a Quaker now. And um, the, the religious society of Quakers have not apologized for their part in slavery. And we said escaped, they wouldn't escape people, they were stolen. Quakers mercilessly stolen from Africa. We have to get the words right, not just um, you know cleaning it up to make it nice. Slavery wasn't nothing but violence and death and nothing else. Um, you talking about you need money for the Lamont house, well, they right there, ask them, make a donation from them. I'm just putting it up against the thing because I'm getting sick and tired of we having misinformation about our history when it's all by white people writing it down and they wrote it down to make them the heroines and the heroines. Um, I'm glad you talked a little bit about the abolitionists, but we was I thought it was gonna be something more about the slavery and what the perpetrators of slave men did to people like you and the ones that's on this um, uh, Zoom with me. I'm, I'm mad as hell about this situation here we have today because if the early Quakers didn't bring us over here to work for them to make their world comfortable and amass great wealth, we wouldn't have this um, white supremacy stuff that we have to deal with today in America. They need to drag Williams Penn behind off that um, city hall up there. They take them all out from the, the South 
but the North was just as racist and just as violent and just as bad for our, us. Um, and thank you for shaking your head and not um, kowtowing to being right nice, but nothing about Quakerism, I mean, nothing about slavery was nice. To exploit people from the womb to the grave, let's get to the nitty gritty. That's what I feel. Thank you. Thank You're you. You're welcome. You're welcome. Who was that? Um, I have a just a quick question. This is uh, Melanie Monk. I missed the connection with the Miller Funeral Home. Oh, I was mentioning that Peter Mott was buried by Edward Miller, who founded the Miller Funeral Home in 1843. So when Peter Mott died in 1881, Edward Miller was the one who uh, interred him at Mount Pisgah African Methodist Episcopal Church Cemetery. Yeah. And okay. So I was curious because um, my father's side of the family, they all went to the Miller Funeral Home. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, the prevalent funeral home of our time, and certainly uh, even in, in the 21st century, they uh, buried a lot of people from Camden and surrounding areas. They still do. They still do. Yeah. Could we ask the people's names? Well, if you have a question and you're on Zoom, or, or even if you're here in the room, if you could say your name, that would be very helpful. Uh, I'm Ruth Darlington from Medford Meeting. I don't, well, I have a question, which is I can't read who to make checks out to. Oh, checks can be made payable to the Lawnside Historical Society. Okay. And said P.O. Box 608, Lawnside, New Jersey. Or you can, 0, put them, 0, 4, you can put them in this basket if you want to write a check today or put, um, another form of donation in here. We'll put it out It's on the um, table in the foyer. Thank you. I'd be glad to take it away. <laughs> <laughs> yes, um, this program has been recorded. Where do we find the recording? Well, I might want to rewind. I will be posting it on the South Jersey Quakers YouTube channel, and I'll include a link for it in um, our South Jersey Quakers newsletter as soon as it's posted. Okay. Otherwise, see me. Friends, if there are no more questions, any more questions? No. <laughs> well, thank you all for coming. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.